John chapter 17. While you do, I'm just going to read from uh, what has been made known as the Lord's Prayer, but my Bible up at the top says, Christ teacheth how to pray. I think that's more fitting. A model prayer. It says this, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So like I said, this is uh, uh, affectionately commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. But it's a rather an example prayer. It's an outline of prayer. It's, it's, it's Christ teaching us how to be praying, essentially giving us a model to follow, setting forth an example. In John chapter 17, you will find, rather, what is called the Lord's Prayer, more, more specifically, and what would be considered, because this is a whole chapter dedicated to Jesus praying unto the Father on our behalf. We're going to read through this to find out more about the Lord's Prayer, but what I'm focusing in on is that first statement in Jesus' model prayer where it says, Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. And here Jesus, following his own example, begins by praying specifically, as we said, to the Father who resides in heaven. John chapter 17 and verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes unto heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son or glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. So here he's looking up to heaven, our Father, right, who art in heaven, praying specifically unto the Father, right, our Father who art in heaven. He's following after that model of prayer that he set forth to his disciples so many chapters previous. Verse 2 says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So here Jesus receives the power that he may give the power. He receives the, um, the, the blessing. He receives the, the glorification that he may also glorify the Father to the end that salvation is fully realized. And they said, this is eternal life. And what is that? This is life eternal that they may know thee, referring to the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And so this is a specific way that men begin to reach out to God. And Jesus Christ is just setting for that, that example. He says in verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, again, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto men which thou hast which thou givest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So here we see the glory being given, the glory being received of Christ, and it was a glory that Jesus Christ had himself before the world was, but here he says that it's a glory that can be received of those that are taken out of the world in verse 6. Verse 7, uh, or the end of verse 6 there, they have kept thy word. And it's interesting because we often refer to the word as being Christ. We often refer to it being as his word that goeth forth. But here we see the connection of how Jesus Christ and the Father have the same word. Well, how is that possible? Because the Father gave us the word to be spoken by the Son. And the ministry of the Spirit is to bring the words into remembrance whatsoever Christ has said. So in, in the fullness of the Godhead, it's all of their word. They, they have ownership over the word in entirety. Verse 7 continues, it says, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they, believe, and they have believed that thou didst send me. It continues on in verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name. 
those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. None of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. They, that they may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, and thou hast, as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And hear that statement that where he makes. He says, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. And back in verse 11, he says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come unto thee, O Father. Jesus Christ referring again that the Father there is settled in heaven. He has basically reckoned himself to be the same, though presently as he prays, he's in the world. He says, I am no more in the world. In other words, I have just reckoned it so that my next step is to be in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. O righteous Father, verse 25, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So we see as Christ walks through this prayer, he begins to expound unto us uh, the, the model for prayer that he also had given us beforehand. And he's constantly referring to the Father, constantly glorifying the Father, constantly asking of the Father whatsoever he hopes to receive. And basically, in this moment, you find it quite often, he'll say, I'm in the Father, the Father in me. I believe this is a, this is a spiritual engagement, and this is what our prayer has to be. We need to be spiritually engaged in prayer with the Father as we're working with him and laboring with him in prayer. Christ at this moment said, I am no more in the world. But if the disciples were able to come and to see, they would see him praying right beside them, right? But he had reckoned himself to be, I believe, in the spirit, essentially united with the Father. And his goal and his endeavor that we would be in that same perfect place with him. Perfect in one through the love and through the truth that he provides. No more in the world, but declaring unto others the same truth that they may join us in that same stance. And this is why we ask... When people, when we go to the door, are you 100% sure that if you were to die today, you'd be in heaven? Because that's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to be with the Father. Even as Christ here in his prayer unto the Father, it was his ultimate goal. And it was the ultimate goal of those that would father, that would bring more with him. Our goal is to be with the Father, our Father, who is in heaven. And we want more to be in that same position. So then as Christ did, and in our model for prayer, and in our opportunity that we have to pray unto him, we should begin with that same position, our Father, which art in heaven. And this is one thing that I would like to explain, which helped me in my area of prayer, and it, it's why Christ laid it out the way he did. Essentially, you take what is termed the Lord's Prayer, or that model prayer, and you just meditate upon these words as you walk through it, and that'll give you basically a guideline of how to follow after your own prayers. So when I sit down or I kneel down or I lay down, the first thing that I think is our Father, which art in heaven. And I begin to meditate upon these things and think about, you know, God is so high. He is so exalted. He is so excellent. He is, he is my Father. He is our Father. 
He is in heaven. That's where he resides. I long to be there. God, help me to be there. I want to be where you are. And I begin to think about those things and call upon God in the same way. And it gives the proper perspective for our prayer. We can begin by reckoning that Christ is the mediator and the one whom we desire to meet with is God himself. And this is the same thing Christ did as he made an example when he actually put it into practice and prayed here in John chapter 17. So Christ gave us the reminder that when we pray, we need to remember to first go to the Father. We need to seek after the Father. And it's through the mediator that is Jesus Christ that we can get there. If you were, you can turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it gives us the, uh, the position where we can even get to the Father. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So here we're expounded or explained unto us, we're given the mediator job that God has. If we're to get to the one God, we're to do it through the mediator that is the man Christ Jesus. And this is how we can get a hold of him. He's holy, the Father is. He is righteous, the Father is. And this is what he said over and over again in his prayer unto him. O holy Father, O righteous Father, O Father. And he lifted him up and exalted him. We need to understand that we can't just go to the Father of our own accord. He will not hear us in our present sinful state. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and in verse 13 it says, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot and unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. So this is describing the Father, I believe. And it is Christ who in his times shall show unto us that blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Now don't let it bother you that the same title has been rightly appropriated to Jesus Christ himself. I believe this is referring specifically to the Father, especially when you see the statement that he's dwelling in the light which no man can approach to. But that also can't bother you. It doesn't need to bother you because at the time Timothy was written, Christ was sitting at the right hand of God in that light that no man can approach unto. So these things shouldn't bother us, but what we should see, and as is indicated many times throughout the Old Testament, God the Father, whom we are to direct our prayers unto, is essentially unapproachable of our own selves, of our own flesh. We can't go toward the light, as the Bible says. No man hath seen, and no man can approach unto this light. So we're kind of in a lost state. We're kind of in a, in a difficult situation. But glory to God, the mediator came. Therefore, we could get a hold of God, and we could reach unto this blessed only potent day. We can reach unto the King of kings and Lord of lords. Through the ministry that is in Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 20, if you would. This is where the, uh, the Ten Commandments came up to us. Exodus chapter 20. And in Exodus chapter 20, you see how it plays out when man tries to get a hold of God. Verse 1 of Exodus chapter 20 says, And God spake all these words, saying, I love that. He spake all these words. These words thundered down from above. And they're those Ten Commandments, those Ten Commandments that bring death unto men, that condemn men, that show us that we can't live by our own works. We can't do these ten simple things and find our way into heaven. In verse 18, it says, After God says these things, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, here he goes and he draws them, he tries to bring them closer. He says, hey, fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be, for, may be before your faces that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off 
and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. So here Moses expounds in that role of mediator that, hey, people, God is powerful. God is big. God is loud. He has thunderings and lightnings, and his word rips to you to the very core. But he's not doing it to scare you off. He's doing it to prove you. He wants his fear to be before you. Draw nigh unto him. And yet you see the people said, hey, Moses, you talk to us and that's fine. We're going to stand afar off. And it was Moses that had the courage, had the guts, had the wherewithal to approach unto God in that thick darkness where he resided. He's in that light which no man can approach unto. He's also in that thick darkness, perhaps indicated by the cloud that is surrounding him by the presence of God where we often see God meeting with folks. So here, Moses plays Christ as, as, as a demonstration or as an example to us. He sees that, we see that the people can't approach unto God. We, we have no means of standing before him. He shakes, he smokes, he, he thunders, he roars. He drives that fear into the hearts of man so that they just simply fall to theirs. There's no approaching unto the Father, even as it said in 1 Timothy there. But meet, meet, as a mediator here, Moses steps out. He tries to draw them in, and yet they would not. But still he has, and we're thankful for that today, Perform the role of a mediator because they heard all the words. We have all the words that Moses heard from God recorded in the scriptures here. So he performed his role as, as Jesus was praying is that he took the word from the Father and brought it unto sinful men that we could behold. If we could have that same experience, we could be one in the Father as the Father in us and Jesus is one in the Father. And we could be united and brought to a place where we can work and labor together with the Spirit of God because provision has been made to do so. So then we need to, as the Bible says, as Christ did, pray unto the Father. Go to him understanding that the only way we can do so is through the mediator that is Jesus Christ. But Jesus isn't just a mediator that brings us the word of the Father and then leaves it alone there. His goal is to do more than what Moses did, right? Moses brought us the word. His word that he brought unto us never brought us unto the Father. It never brought us unto salvation. It showed us how to fear him. It, it proved us. It reckoned us indeed dead. It was the schoolmaster that drove us in the direction of Christ. But Jesus performed the role of Moses even better and even further where he stepped out and grabbed us and took us unto the Father, fulfilling the full duty of the mediator. Hebrews chapter 9 talks about this and compares the two ministries very well. Hebrews chapter 9. And verse 1 says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So here we see that these, these services are divine. They're, they're godly services that they went through. But the sanctuary was a worldly one. It was earthly. It was sensual. You could reach out and touch it. You could behold it with your eyes. And this is what the whole first covenant was based on. Divine service in a worldly sanctuary. Verse 6 continues. It says, Now, when these things were thus ordained, being the divine service, being the worldly sanctuary, and, and all of the happenings in about it, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertained to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come. So we see the, uh, the original was given by the Holy Ghost, laid out as a divine service which could never make men perfect, but was one that showed with meats and drinks and divers washings. It was imposed on them to the end 
that the time of reformation would come upon them. And here Christ enters in to fulfill what's been playing out for years and years and years previous under the old covenant. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, verse 11, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies through the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And so all that to say is it's very, it's very well explained if you read this. It's just, it's just a joy to take basically what you could gather from reading the entirety of the Old Testament and gather from reading the entirety of the Gospels and seeing Paul's writings after. Hebrews very well explains the entirety of it, all that, that those worldly ordinances that were divine in nature, that had all sorts of works involved, all sorts of furnishings. They needed the blood of bulls and of goats. They needed the ashes of a heifer. They needed all of these things, all these rituals that the high priest would do once a year, that the other priests would do repeatedly and constantly. They were all to the end that this point would be proven is that it's only a fleshly thing. The mediator of the New Testament is Christ, and by his death, the redemption that is full, that is complete, that is the promised gift unto all mankind, whosoever should be called and whosoever should receive it, as it says in verse 15, that eternal inheritance is through Christ, through the Spirit which he offered his own self, without spot, unto God. All that to say this, this is the means by which Christ as the better mediator of a better covenant, of better promises, came and didn't just say, hey, here's a bunch of to-dos that are going to do nothing but condemn you. Rather, here is a bunch that I have done in order to give you the opportunity to receive a gift that will give you the promise of eternal heavens. He brought us to the Father. He didn't just lay out how we could not ever achieve and receive and come to the Father. No, that was to the end that Christ would be received in us. That, that was basically the preview that damned us. And now Christ, being the media of the better testament, provides for us the free gift. Verse 24 explains more. It says, For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. I love this. For us. Right? Our desire is to be in the presence of God. There's no better place than to be with our Father who art in heaven. But first we needed Christ to appear for us. Verse 25, Not yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this to judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Here Christ the first time, when he presented himself before God, right? When he was hanging from that cross, the, body says, the Bible says, In his body bore he all of our sins. That's what the Bible says here, that he bore the sins of many when he was once offered and died the death that we deserve. But then it says this, And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time, where? Before the Father, without sin unto salvation. So Christ is going to ensure at that time, when he stands before the Father, he'll bring us with him, and he will appear before God without sin unto salvation. And it is this presentation of Christ to God that allows us salvation, allows us to enter in. He appeared in the presence of God for us, and he's going to do it in two times the Bible indicates here. Once, wherein he bore the sins of many, and then again without sin unto salvation to show that the way is now provided. 
Hebrews chapter 10, if you look across at verse 14, continues in this vein. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. This is a great verse proving the eternal security because he has perfected, he has completed by that one offering them forever that are sanctified. If you've been sanctified, if you've been washed, if you've been cleansed, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, then you will remain that way forever. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will, in their minds will I write them. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. And that's a wonderful thing, and that's a wonderful truth, because that is showing you in verse 17 and 18 that the sins and the iniquities that we have, God is remembering them no more. Therefore, where they are remitted, where they are removed, there is no more offering for sin. So there was that one offering that Christ did, which paved the way for us to be received by the Father. Therefore, having therefore, verse 19 says, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from, the ev from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And this is a great bit of truth that you grab a hold of here, where he is saying, because your sins and iniquities are remembered no more, because there is no more offering for your sin because they have been remitted, because Christ did what he did on the cross and provided the way of salvation, because of that, it says in verse 15, we have to have boldness to enter into the holiest of all. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. So because we've put our faith in Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection to provide the way, we can step forward into the presence of God with full assurance. And then even as Christ said in John chapter 17, which we read at the beginning, I am no more in the world. We can draw unto, we can draw near unto with full assurance where? Into the holiest. Well, where's the holiest? Well, the Bible describes the holiest being the place where Jesus Christ took his blood. And that is the tabernacle not made of this world, not made of this flesh, but the one that resides in heaven. We can step into what the high priest could only do once a year. We can step into that day by day, moment by moment, with the full assurance of faith that when we do... Christ will be there to provide the way, to provide the mediatorship that we can get a hold of the Father there. It's a great truth because this is describing the fact that when Jesus told us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, he wasn't telling us to do something that we could never achieve. He was simply saying that, hey, you can get a hold of the Father in heaven because of all this that has been done for you. Because you are saved, you can have full assurance of the faith that you have. Your heart sprinkled from that evil conscience. Your body's washed in pure water. Everything cleansed. Everything clean. Everything washed away to the point where God doesn't remember it any further when you step into his presence. Having then that full assurance, verse 23 continues and it says, and I like this, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. So when we step Boldly in prayer, it says have full assurance, but it also says hold fast the profession of our faith. Hold fast the declaration of our faith. Hold fast everything that you believe and have said that you believe as you step forward without wavering into this position. Be confident when you've come before the Father in prayer. For he is faithful, that promise, right? It is his faith, the Bible says, it's Christ's faith that provided that way for us. Verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke one another to love and to good works. So here we are bringing people along with us, just like Jesus highlighted in John chapter 17. Go and read it again. I didn't have a lot of time to go through the ins and outs of that whole passage. But essentially he's saying, hey, God the Father, I need to get a hold of you. And when I get a hold of you, I'll be glorified that I may glorify you. And these that you have given me are glorified that they might glorify you. And I don't 
pray for the world, but I pray for them that they might bring others that would follow in the same paths that I have provided, and that is the way unto heaven. That is the truth, that is the life, that no man can come unto the Father but by that way that I have provided. And here he says, let us consider one another. So even as we get to the point where we can, without without lacking, without wavering, come before the Father, consider others and bring them along with you. Provoke them to love and to good works. And verse 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I've often heard it said that if you don't like meeting in the house of God, if you don't like church, if you don't like singing and praising God, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, if you don't like the preaching of God's word, if you don't like prayer, if you don't like fellowship, you're not going to like heaven. Because that's what it's going to be full of. And this is why he says, hey, there is the new living way. Here where is where you can step forward in full assurance of faith. You can come before God boldly enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hold fast that profession. Consider one another. Bring them along with us. And don't forsake the assembly. Because this is all what's going on here. A little slice of heaven. It's why Jesus could say, I'm no longer in the world while he's standing on the same soil that we're walking in. Because Jesus Christ was looking and believing and trusting as we can that, hey, when I get on my knees and pray, when I am seeking the Father, where am I? Well, I'm taking a step out of this world into the holiest of all, where I get a hold of Him and have fellowship with Him. And, and it's in those moments that truly I am being spiritual. Truly I am being led of the Spirit. Truly I am in, encountering something that is not of this world. And I believe that He brings church then into the immediate context to say, hey, when you assemble together, you're not to forsake that because what you're forsaking is what's going to be promised unto you for all eternity. And that is singing and fellowshipping and praising God and hearing the preaching of God's word. And this is what we're going to do day after day, year after year, month after month, world without end. Amen. We're going to enjoy what we have here on much greater scales. You'll have a much better preacher then. Don't worry. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be a wonderful time. It's not something that we need to forsake while we're here, though. So grab a hold of these things. Get a hold of the fact that you can, through the mediator, enter in through Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, resurrection, through the blood that was placed upon us because he has made that provision for us. He has covered us. So then, the further study of our Father who art in heaven, beginning our prayer from that position, is to understand that what is now real only through the Spirit, only through being engaged in spiritual prayer and spiritual songs and hymns, in fellowship one with another, the, the spiritual present reality will one day be realized bodily. This should humble us. We're going to get to the point that what we're doing here will be done in heaven. We only have a little slice, a little taste, a little earnest, a little down payment of the things which are to come. But God set forth the church to be the example of what we will engage in one day. And the prayer closet is the same thing. We can go and find a quiet place where we can seek unto God and get a hold of Him and engage with Him and see great spiritual truths. 2 Corinthians, if you would, chapter 1, 2 Corinthians, chapter 1. 2 Corinthians, chapter 1. We see the Apostle Paul saw great things. 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, in verse 1. Hmm. Maybe 11, verse 1. I wrote it down wrong in my Bible. <clears throat> Second Corinthians, when Paul saw great things in heaven. Do you remember this one? <clears throat> twelve. Second Corinthians twelve. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory, he says. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or without the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. 
And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for men to utter. Of such and one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Here the Apostle Paul is highlighting, and I believe he's just being humble, where he says in the body or without a body, and I knew such a man. It seems that the Apostle Paul has great understandings and revelations of Scripture. He saw great things. If he wasn't actually caught up into the third heaven, perhaps he had first-hand knowledge of somebody who was and, and had, a, had a faithful witness of such things that were seen. But either way, he doesn't want to talk about these things. He doesn't want to glory in those things. You can see then that there was an opportunity for someone, whether it was the Apostle Paul or not, to be caught up into the third heaven, return, and therefore did not find it meet to speak of such great things. There was no glory here to be had, though great visions and revelations came to us. Now each and every one of us doesn't have to have a great vision, a spiritual quest where you go up into heaven, you see all these great revelations. We have these in our, in our hand. We have the Bible, which has greater revelations than even the visions that people see. The Apostle Peter said that. He said, we have a more sure word of prophecy whereby you do well to take heed. So he wasn't even going to get puffed up in all the visions that he saw when, when he was ministering with Christ and after Christ and, and before he passed away, all the things that he went through. But what these great revelations should do, and as we read the scriptures and have great revelations from the Father, we need to understand that what they should do to us is drive us to minister. Verse 7 says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buff, buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for, in my, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak... Then am I strong. I become a fool in glory, and ye have compelled me. For I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing I am behind the very chiefest of apostles, though I be nothing. And if you read down in verse 14, it says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come unto you. Now these are the people he's reaching up to in Corinth. He's wrote to them once. He's wrote unto them twice. And he says, For I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. The reality here was that the Apostle Paul had great revelations. If it wasn't that he took this journey into the third heaven, he penned most of the New Testament, had these revelations in real time come unto him, laid them out for people. But it didn't drive him to be puffed up and bold in his knowledge. Rather, it brought him to a place where he was humbled, albeit with the help of a messenger of Satan that God put on him to buffet him. But that was all to the end that I believe the Apostle Paul could have more visions, more understanding, more revelations of God, because there was less of a risk even that a man as great as the Apostle Paul would be puffed up and exalted above measure through the abundance of these revelations. So God, when he came, when, when Paul came to him and sought the Father and said, Father, thrice, could you please remove this Satan, satanic messenger from me, this thorn in my flesh, take it away from me. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, that the power of Christ may rest upon you. The Apostle Paul realized that he would rather glory in the infirmities, in the weakness that he had. Because in that weakness, he was made strong. And it was all to the end that he would reach out to these that were his children. And as a parent ought to, lay up for them, save up for them, give them spiritual opportunities that they would never have otherwise, and lay up treasure for them, being spent by them, working abundantly, laboring abundantly, loving them abundantly, realizing though that as he did, it was less that he was loved. 
So the real and present response that we have when we go to Christ in the Spirit, when we're meeting with the Father in heaven, the, real, the reality that we get a hold of when we're present will one day be realized bodily, but it's not there yet. And while it's not there yet, we need to understand that Christ's grace is sufficient for us. So while we can come before the Father once, twice, three times, and try to get a hold of Him to change something in our lives, we're coming to a Father that understands greater than us the things that we have need of. And therefore, He will often say unto us, His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. And as He reveals Himself more and more unto us, don't be surprised if He puts more troubles, more thorns, more trials into your life to keep you humble because when you are at your weakest, God has the ability to be strongest in you. Our Father who art in heaven, He's our maker. He's our master. He's in heaven. He's high above. We cannot approach unto him. We can't achieve that. We can't get there by our own merits. But Christ has provided the way. And that's through prayer we can get a hold of him. Because the mediator stepped in and allowed us into the holiest of all. That place made without hands where we can commune with the Father. Honestly, this place is the stage for a humble and meek heart that can seek the Father face to face face to face. Get a hold of the Father face to face. Hear that the Father would hear his pleas, hear his reasons, hear his desires, and begin to work with him in that secret place of prayer. But when that happens, you notice the humble servant doesn't step before God and say, God, I, I need a bigger house, I need a nicer car, I need, I need more things, I need toys, I need more money, I need nicer clothes. No, the humble servant, as the Apostle Paul did, when he stepped into the third heaven and got a hold of God the Father at this time. He wasn't driven to puff himself up. He wasn't driven to get more for himself. Though he sought, he sought the Lord thrice, that these aches and pains or whatever it was, the messenger of Satan would depart from him. Ultimately, in the end, his real reason for being there was that he could lay up for his children, he could be spent for his children, and abundantly he could love his children. So when we step before the Father in the right position, when we say, Our Father and art in heaven, when you start your prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, and you start to think about your Father and where he is, it ought to humble us because we're going to start to meditate about how, the, how we even got a hold of the Father, how we can even pray unto the Father, who provided the way unto the Father, what am I before the Father? And you begin to seek, not for yourself, because the, the view of yourself becomes lower and lower and lower. You begin to seek for others to be blessed, strengthened, helped, even saved. It draws the focus away from me because I'm elevating God when I begin my prayers. Our Father who art in heaven. It begins to draw the focus away from me, but begins to understand that if I'm having infirmities, it's only that glory would be done in me. The power of Christ may dwell upon you. When I see that I'm weak and I step before the Father, and I say, Father in heaven, and I'm about to utter about a weakness that I need him to give me strength upon, I say, Father in heaven, you sent your son to do such and such for me, everything for me. You gave it all in order that I could even stand before you. Therefore, I will rather glory in these weaknesses that I may be strong, that you may be strong through me. It gives you the right focus. This is why Christ began his model prayer. This is why Christ began his prayer in John 17 with our Father who art in heaven. We ought to do the same. It's a model prayer. Just meditate upon these things for a while. Go to God in prayer. I mean, sometimes when I'm praying, if I'm praying through the Lord's Prayer, I won't even get past halfway through verse 1, our Father who art in heaven. And I spend the next 10, 20, 30, whatever minutes just glorifying him, lifting him up, Giving, giving praise unto him that I can even stand before our Holy Father and utter any word. Our Father who art in heaven. And we seek him from that position. It puts us on the right plane where we understand we are very low. And one day we will be very high. But it's only because of what you have done for us. Thank you God. For